if I'm reflecting on what it feels like now to wake up in the morning, it's a lot better than it was in my early 20s. Hated teaching, like absolutely hated what I was doing every single day, but it just, it wasn't right for me. So how long did it take you to realize that I need to get out of this? About five minutes after I turned up on the first day. <laughs> I had an absolutely vile mentor, it really did made my life how so many people are going through it, but not many people are really honest about what they're feeling. Everyone wants to look like they're successful on social media. When I left teaching, I went into the events world and I ran shows that were at the NEC. So I started building this idea of like, what if we had an event that was for young people when they graduated from university? And I wanted to create a festival style event where you could and all that stuff. But you could also have fun, have a really good time and day out with your friends. And that was Talk 20s, that was the idea. January 2020, I launched my Instagram page and my website and I put my logo out there. But we all know, how, what, know what happened by March 2020. Now, yeah, we've got, you know, listenership of over 30,000 young people that have listened to like one or more episodes. Like even after I'd started the business, I probably didn't fully believe that this, what, what I'm doing now is even possible, which is wild. Gabby, thank you for, for joining me today. Oh, thanks for um, me. As always, we start our podcast with the question of what is the most important lesson that you've ever learned? Oh gosh, there's so many growing up, isn't there? I think, I think with especially what I do, I learn lessons all the time. Um, the biggest lesson I've ever learned in relation to what I do is probably that it takes longer than you think it does to become successful. Um, I think what we're projected on social media and um, you know across TV and all the different media that we all consume is we tend to think that overnight success is possible and just you know it just comes from a fluke and especially with all like you know viral moments and all this kind of stuff but I think what I've really learned from doing what I do is that it takes time perseverance getting up each day working hard um, and remaining consistent most importantly so I probably say that's the biggest lesson because yeah oh, cool yeah. you mentioned success there what what's success to you what does that mean that I'm happy, that I'm fulfilled in what I do, and most importantly, the people that I also employ are happy and enjoy what they do and are feeling fulfilled um, as well. I think ultimately, for me, it's about becoming the best person that I can possibly be in my life. So that, you know, across business, across personal life, that's the same thing. Um, and just making sure that, you know, like, you know, you, you only get one one shot at this. So to just, yeah, to really enjoy it and to and to feel like you've helped other people at the same time, because ultimately that's that's what my business is aimed at. As a, a founder that I follow, he like summed up success perfectly for me. He said he defines success as the first two seconds in the morning. So when he opens his eyes, if he wants to get out of bed, then he's successful. If he doesn't want to get out of bed, then he needs to work harder because he's not successful. Interesting. Mm. I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah, that's really cool. And I think if I'm reflecting on what it feels like now to wake up in the morning, it's a lot better than it was in my early 20s. So yeah, I'd agree. Moving on to, to your platform, Talk 20s, I guess. Mm. That's sort of what it's about, isn't it? The uh, like advice you needed in your early 20s. So do you want to just touch on that a little bit more and explain what, what Talk 20s is? Yeah, so uh, Talk 20s is a media platform. We're a podcast, social media, website and events to come. Um, platform where essentially we help guide you from, you know, whatever was your last bit of school, whether that's school, university, um, whatever it was, and stepping into the big wide world of adult life we know that period of your life can be so daunting there are so many questions you're asking yourself you're trying to unlearn behaviors from when you were younger you're kind of figuring out that school didn't really teach you all that much about adult life um but like you probably also feel quite alone in that because so many people are going through it but not many people are really honest about what they're feeling everyone wants to look like they're successful on social media or absolutely smashing it and no one's really talking about how hard that can be or how you can actually do that successfully and navigate it successfully um so we kind and offer people you know a one-stop shop for everything that you kind of feel like you need to know in your 20s so how did that start and, and how long has it been going for um so i had the idea i really wanted to launch an event for young people um i kind of felt like i'd been going to something called the clothes show at the nec for like a long time when i was a kid growing up and it doesn't exist anymore sadly but that was like one of the funnest things that i used to do i used to go with my mum and that really sparked probably my um passion for uh, shows and events like that you know it was kind of it was a 
business to consumer show if you want to put like the business spin on it um but essentially what it was was loads of makeup stands loads of um you know loads of clothes stands obviously being called the clothes show like, just, bo- like body power if you know what yeah that like is. body power yeah. it was like that but for kind of young women who or, and, and you know young men who just loved you know fashion and, okay, and cool. makeup and all of those kind of things and it used to be on in early december every single year and I used to go with my mum. And then when I got to university, I used to work on an eyebrow makeup stand at the show because I went to university in Birmingham and it was at the NEC. And for me, I was like, this event is just amazing. Like, it's infectious. Like, it's just the energy is so cool. And you can't get this anywhere else. Like, you can't walk down the high street and get this kind of feeling. Like, there, there was also, like, a massive stage and arena when you went there. And I used to see, like, the Saturdays, like, performed. And they did this great big, like, catwalk and stuff like that. And I was like, this is such an immersive experience of everything that I love. And as I was growing up, I started to think, like, this could be done in so many different formats. And I then kind of didn't really know what direction I was going in, in with my career. So I, at this time, you know, I went to university, I studied education, I then left and graduated and went into teaching. Absolutely hated teaching, um, but kind of thought, you know, I have, a, I still have a passion for educating people. And I feel like there's just something out there that would really work that would mash these two ideas together. So when I left teaching, I went into the events world and I ran shows that were at the NEC, like crazy full circle moment for me. But these events were in additive manufacturing and <laughs> um, plastics and medical technology. Well, quite as glamorous. Riveting stuff, <laughs> you know? And they were business to business trade shows. They were, you know, all about business trying to sell this great big machine that can produce this kind of plastic. I, I mean, I don't even really know to this day. Um, so for me, I was like, I love the event side of things and I'm really doing what I want to do. But like, this, I'm not passionate about this, the topic of the subject. So I started building this idea of like, okay, well, what if we had an event that was for young people when they graduated from university that they could go to to get help and guidance on, you know, navigating their finances. If they're a little bit further along in their life, maybe what they want to save to buy their first home, who teaches you that? Maybe they're struggling with their well-being and they can get support there. Maybe they want to get ahead in their career and they want some help and guidance on that. You know, maybe they just want to have fun, go traveling and all of those kind of things. And I wanted to create a festival style event where you could learn all that stuff but you could also have fun, have a really good time and day out with your friends. Um, And that was the whole idea. I thought, you know, we'd have a main headline stage where we'd have amazing young people speaking. And that was Talk 20s, that was the idea. Okay. January, 2020, I launched my Instagram page and my website and I put my logo out there. But we all know what what happened by March, 2020. You know, this whole events idea, yeah, couldn't happen. No chance. no chance. Everyone was like, you know, and at this point I was still working in that events job. Um, so I kept, you know, I kept the job and we kept dropping down hours, 80% this, this and that, or like whatever, um, with all the with all the furlough and stuff like that. And um, eventually I just went, this idea can still exist. Like I can still help young people. It doesn't have to be the event idea. Like I wasn't like, you know, I think I can still get started without having to do the event. And getting started for me was launching a podcast. And then the podcast just kind of snowballed from there. It was really popular. We've had, we, we started getting pitches from like amazing people to come on the podcast. I was like, hang on a sec. Like, what, what's this going on? What's this going on here? Like, who's seeing this? Um, why do they want to come on my podcast and that sort of thing? And yeah, it just rolled from there. And so now, yeah, we've got, you know, listenership of over 30,000 young people that have listened to like one or more episodes. I think it's more close to 40,000 now, um, which is crazy. We did do a small kind of live podcast um, event last year, and now we are looking to return back to that original idea, having a platform of over, yeah, 40,000 young people to kind of promote that too. And yeah, I think eventually, this is why we call ourselves a media business, because we're media and events. And, you yeah. know, it's not, a lot of people would just look at it and go, just see the podcast and think, oh, that's really cool. But we're really trying to expand it now to say, no, this is this is for everyone. And it's not just a podcast that Gabby started. It's not the Gabby show or anything like that. This is for everyone. Um, and we will hopefully create that amazing, immersive events and keep growing the brand as much as we can. As, as someone in their 20s, um, it's something that wasn't there before and, and the advice that, that you guys sort of provide is advice that you don't get anywhere else. Even before we started recording, I was asking you yeah. some advice about like you know the media business and yeah. stuff that you can't Google. No. Your parents don't know. You, 
teachers don't know, your lecturers don't know. Yeah. So I spend most of my week kind of helping out people who are just like two or three years behind where I am. They're just like, you know, launching out. My, my business has been around for like three years, but I thought about it for about a year year prior to that so technically it's been on my brain for like four years and there's people who are at all different stages of that process trying to figure it out and at all of those pace paces I've had been very lucky to have people who would point me in the right direction to get me to the next point so when someone asks me a question about you know should I get an office or how do I go about brand partnerships and all this kind of stuff I'm quite happy to give them my experience because it'll help fast track them to get to where I am so I, I try my best to to help most people out you know, it does get quite exhausting because it's like, you know, a lot of hours of my day kind of kind of messaging people back or kind of chatting to people. But at the same time, that's like part of part of the job, I think, yeah. you know. I was going to ask, who, who did you ask these questions to when you were starting? Have um, you got parents that ran businesses or anything like that? I don't. And I think that's one of the hardest things that maybe would have helped me maybe get to where I am a little bit quicker. But also, I, I'm also very aware that what I'm building doesn't exist in the world. And it's also relatively new, like we are kind of paving a new path that not many have paved before. So the kind of people that I look up to is like the likes of like Stephen Bartlett, like in terms of the podcast side of things. I also was very close to being acquired by a media and events company last year. And, you know, the advice that I got from them was also really helpful in kind of helping me grow where, to where I am right now. And then... I had friends who were two or three years down the line um, who I could ask these kind of things too. So, you know, I've got a really close friend who runs a company called Girls in Marketing, helping young women get into marketing. And, you know, we're now like on a very, a very similar point in our business, but that one time, you know, she was, you know, really, really absolutely smashing it. Still is absolutely smashing it. But like, she'd done more things than I could, I had yeah. in business. And it was easier for, uh, for her to like, you know, well, it was, it was nice of her to sit down and be like, oh yeah, I've done this and I've done that. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. And then I've kind of navigated my own things. And then now it's much more of a, like an even transaction, you know, transaction, that sounds horrible, but like, you know, it's much more even in terms of like the advice that we give. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? And it's much more we're peers now. Um, but before, you know, I was kind of always looking up to her and I think it's always about finding people in your life that are kind of, I call them expanders. Yeah. So they expand your view on things. They teach you things that are different to kind of what you already know and um, kind of opening up new pathways and kind of, you know, it's all neurological, isn't it? All things that you didn't already know before. Um, but I'm super grateful, you know, for people like that that I've had in my life that are either at the same point as me or just ahead and we can just kind of help each other out as we kind of go along. And yeah, it's definitely, you've got to, you, you can't, you can't just take from it though you've got to give as well it's important to just <clears throat> ask as well isn't it i think yeah like i've asked some people for guidance and help that i would have never thought would help like you know guys that charge a lot of money to give people advice yeah. on business yeah. and stuff but i've just sent them a message and said could you give me a hand with this or what's your yeah. opinion on this and i think if you ask people most people will just help yeah. you they'll give you their time yeah you know if you just want five minutes to to have a chat over a concept most people if you ask nicely and you've got a good relationship with them, they'll help you. My thing would always be like, especially when you're young, try not to pay for that advice. Yeah, yeah. And that can be really tricky because some people are too busy and won't be able to offer you that advice and that's fine. You just kind of have to take it as like a rejection or whatever. But the people I found who genuinely wanted to help me and, 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 and kind of push me in the right direction were people who weren't... Um, who weren't in it for some kind of financial gain for their own kind of reason. Like, I think that's really important. And so it's the people who, you know, who are there, who just want to see you do well. They're yeah. the people that you need to kind of find to help yeah. you. Have you ever paid for a podcast guest? No. No. Never. Someone asked me this the other day. They said um, that they'd seen someone had advertised that they would go on a podcast for a certain amount of money. And they said, oh, why don't you pay someone to come on to get like, you know, a first viral podcast? I said, I'd feel so uncomfortable trying to like sit and have an authentic conversation with someone that I've paid to come and talk to me. Yeah, we get pictures from insane people. And, um, you know, when we have tried to then pitch out to people, I think people think that we're maybe further along down the line than we are because of how our content looks. Yeah. And also maybe don't really understand the etiquette of podcasts because it's supposed to be a kind of dual benefit like yeah, yeah like you guys benefit from someone coming onto your platform but i get an opportunity to sell my story yeah. and 
that's to tell my story, not sell my story, whatever that came out <laughs> as, to tell my story. And so, um, yeah, there will be some people that will come to you and say, yeah, you know, what kind of fee are you offering to come on the podcast or this and kind of that. You know, we spoke to one artist's team. I won't name names, but they have been on Strictly Come Dancing. That's the only clue I'm giving. Eight grand they wanted. Eight grand. Eight grand for them to come on the podcast. And... I was like, thank you very much. Really, really nice to hear that. Um, yeah, we'll be in touch. Um, but yeah, I, I think we've never paid for a podcast guest and we haven't needed to. There are so many people who are ins- amazing people who have, you know, loved the platform and what we're building that we don't need to pay them to come on here. Like right. they want to, you know, share their story. We give them an insane platform to do so. Um, and, and quite often these are people who don't have a 60 minute window to tell their story and for people to sit down and listen. They are you know they've got a 30 second clip that's going viral on 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 instagram or they've got you know a business and they're a bit more behind the scenes and but this is their opportunity to tell their story on a platform you know we're like a magazine really yeah um so it's kind of hard and when you're navigating that i think it's tricky um work with what you can um that being said we do pay for travel and accommodation if it's needed for for yeah. guests because that is kind of something that we don't want them to we want them to come onto the button but we don't want them to be out of pocket for the yeah, for exactly. the opportunity for coming on on the podcast if I that makes sense being in liverpool yeah. as well like yeah it allows you to get guests up from from London, London and all of those not, kinds yeah. of things yeah so it's like yeah I know absolutely and then we treat them well like you know we make sure that we you know send them loads of content ahead of time we send them a little PR box to say thank you loads of goodies in like so yeah we it's not about not paying people it's just not the 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 way that podcast really is kind no. of kind of done so let's talk a little bit about your education so you mentioned uni then um studied education how did you find uni did was it a good experience for you did you yeah. enjoy it yeah I loved it Ultimately, I loved it. I met my um, fiance in my first, at the very end of my first semester of university. So we met at Christmas sports night by the Mermaid Fountain, the University of Birmingham, if anyone is listening from the University of Birmingham, on a night out. And yeah, been inseparable ever since, <laughs> nine years later. Pretty crazy. So I, uh, you know, I owe university the fact, you know, the fact that I met my I met my fiance there but not only that like I really did enjoy my course the only downside to my course was that when I was looking at universities I was really interested in the topic which was they named the the course culture citizens and education and it was all about how people how we learn how people grow you know how we kind of develop as humans it was super you know how like history psychology sociology and then when I got there they were like oh yeah like you've you've got into University of Birmingham but we're changing the name of course to just education and that really had a negative impact because the course content remained the same but it was the perception of what people thought that I studied that completely changed so everyone thought I was just studying for three years to be a teacher and it wasn't that because because it was 100% theory of, you know, literally going back to the cavemen at some points. How did they learn how to do this? You know, going back to like the schooling years, you know, how was that developed over the years? So like psychologically, how do we actually do develop as humans from, you know, young, younger age? And it was just, it was so theory based. It was so million More miles like his, away. History, psychology. Yeah, as well, then, yeah, it was history, psychology, sociology. Um, there was just, yeah philosophy just philosophy like i don't Mm. think you do philosophy and when you're learning to be a teacher but you know philosophy of knowledge like what is knowledge what is learning like my god those lectures (laughs) yeah so it was really annoying because then when i got to graduating i used to go to like the um i used to go to like the great hall where they used to have all the graduate career fairs and all that kind of stuff and i'd go up to like pwc or um you know kpmg or any of the other like you know consulting firms or any of the big you know even aldi i think we're doing like a 40 grand yeah. um graduate program or whatever and i'd go up to them and i'd be like and i remember i can't remember which which um company it was but i remember going up to them and then being like really excited like you know it's really nice to meet you and you could see that they had like a really good vibe and they were like really happy to talk and they were like you know just chatting for a few minutes they're like oh like what do you study and i was like um i study education and they were like oh cool they was like Teach First is over there. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I know Teach First is over there, but I'm talking to you. Like, mm. I, like you can't just assume that I'm going to be a teacher just because I've studied education. And it was just really hard because that was felt like what I had, that wasn't what I studied. So 
honestly that knocked my confidence real big time and um I was like look that no one's ever going to take me as an education graduate no one's ever going to like take me seriously and stuff like that I'll just have to suck it up and go and do my teacher qualification because honestly most of the people in my course did actually go on to do that like they were really invested in being teachers and I really wasn't and I don't think I I regret it like I shouldn't I should have followed my gut more and pushed harder in those times I think I was a bit more um I was living in a world where I thought that like to be successful you just needed to get a, a decentish job that everyone thought was good out of university and if the best job I could get was uh, being a teacher then that was it but when it's teaching hated it absolutely hated it and thought no I'm not gonna I'm gonna stand up for myself this time I'm gonna do something that actually does you know light me up and make me want to want to wake up every that one or two seconds you know get up yeah, and yeah. actually and like my myself on my job in the morning so yeah there's yeah. such a big emphasis on like wage out of university i've found yeah because i'm on a master's now so most pretty much all my friends graduated last year yeah and have all gone into work and it's like when i talk to them it's like i'm on this salary i'm on this salary i'm on this salary and i'm like well, it, how's the job though do you like it are you happy yeah do you enjoy your job yeah. most of them no they don't yeah but they're like you know yeah but in five years time i'll be on 60k i'll be on 70k mm. and it's like but what's your like mental state going to be in five years time of a job mm. that you don't like that's what i think we went round um and did our street style content uh earlier this week and we asked that exact question we asked people would you rather um be on minimum wage in a job that you love or would you rather have a job that you absolutely hate but be earning 50k plus and everyone but one person said minimum wage dream yeah. like dream job um and that was super interesting and the person that did say 50k was because they said that they really liked buying like expensive fashionable clothes and that's what brought them happiness and that wasn't really a job thing but like it was like that's genuinely what made them happy so they needed the money to feel good in themselves interesting answer um mm. it was really dressed really cool as well so yeah I kind of got that vibe but I thought that you know it's interesting because it's like then it comes back to the question of like does money bring you happiness and to a degree I think it probably definitely helps like nobody likes paying you know getting paid and then every single bit of that money going out in bills and having nothing else for you know pleasure or enjoyment that's not fun but there definitely is a threshold where I think you definitely take enjoying what you do more than an extra few hundred pounds in the bank. You talk to some of them companies like PwC and you know the top four and all those massive grad hires. It's the mate. The only sort of selling point that a lot of these companies have is we'll pay you you know a London wage. You can be on a, a nice you know thirty five forty grand salary work in the city. Mm. You don't ever hear much about these are the perks, these are the benefits, this is the stuff we're going to do for your well being, free gym membership, all that. It's always like. This is how much money you're going to earn. Like, I think it's money. I think it's also trajectory. Mm. So I think it's like what they can promise you. Like within three years time, you're going to be, be a manager. This. Yeah. It's not just about being on this kind of wage. It's like you'll be a manager or you could be head of department. Or you could be this and this. I think people are looking for that as well because I think they also think that that equals success, you know, like seniority within a business and how fast you can fast track yourself for a business. Um, yeah, I think that that's probably two measures that people try and measure their career happiness on but actually it's, it is just about how you wake up in the morning so when you were at university and you were like making this decision to go and be a teacher mm. was there any um anything provided by your university or any content you've seen online that was like you can leave university and set up your own business if you want to was no. there anything out there did you know anyone that had done that as well no no <laughs> no it wasn't really my plan like right. i i don't think i when i was younger i don't think i thought oh, i'm I kind of did was like oh like I did have a few I remember having a few like, business ideas that I told my dad about and he'd be like yeah this might work because of this and this might work because that but, but remember my dad's not entrepreneurial like so I kind of grew up in a household that wasn't entrepreneurial um so whilst we talked about it I don't think I ever really thought that it was possible for me because I didn't really see that really being modeled around me because you know they had really successful both my parents had successful careers you know in the corporate world um so for me i probably didn't think i could actually make a living and employ people and do all of this probably until like genuinely the last 12 24 months maybe okay like even after i'd started the business i probably didn't fully believe 
that this what what I'm doing now is even possible, which is wild. So how long did it take you into your like teaching career to realize that I need to get out of this? About five minutes after I turned up on the first day. <laughs> What was it that made you think that? In my gut, it wasn't right. Um, <coughs> and I did stay for two years. Wow. So, yeah, I, I stayed. I did. The thing is, like, when you do a qualification like that, you kind of are, you're, you finish your qualification after two years. And I was like, so now, technically, I could still apply for a teaching job. And I would be 100% qualified. They probably have some questions around why I wasn't, haven't been teaching <laughs> for the past few, past few years. But you don't lose your, um, once you've done your two years, you never, you've got it for life. Okay. Um, so I kind of was like, I'll do that. And I was going to leave after the first year. Now, the first year was much more like learning on the job. I didn't have as many, you know, courses and stuff like that. But the first year was far the worst. I had an absolutely vile mentor. Like, that's the only way I can describe them just really did made my life how used to play like really childish games like whispering like leaving me in a room at parents evening to speak to prospective students about the school of which I'd been in for two weeks while she was standing over by I was a French teacher by the croissants and all of that kind of stuff and all the other teachers just giggling just giggling and bitching and just like leaving me and you can just tell like they're just it was nasty like it was yeah. actually bitchy and I think that that really put me off because I think the second school that I then worked in in my second year was a completely different experience. It was a really nice school that I worked in. I'm still friends with the teaching staff that I used to work with. We go out for dinner, you know, once every two, three months and I'm still really, really close to them. And that's when I was like, I'm glad that I did do that extra year because it proved to me that it, it wasn't just the environment where that, you know, horrible mentor and nasty bitchy environment because I then moved to another school where the environment was much more supportive and what have you. But I still knew that it wasn't right in my gut. And I was good at teaching. Like, I wasn't a bad teacher. Like, they, they still to this day say, oh, I'm, you know, you're the best NQT we've ever, ever had. I was the best NQT, but hated teaching. Like, yeah. absolutely hated what I was doing every single day. So I was more than capable but it just, it wasn't right for me. But I'm glad, I'm still glad I did those two years. Yeah. In a way, it taught me a lot. Taught me a lot of resilience as well. I've got a lot of friends that did education at uni and like primary ed courses like that. And going and doing the blocks of placement made them realise they didn't want to be teachers. It was education studies. It wasn't learn to be a teacher. Yeah. Like that's the thing is that it was named wrong. Like yeah. it should have been stayed citizens, culture and education. Like because that's what it was. Like there wasn't, you know, there wasn't really enough to do that there was like a placement module thing which i think some people did go into schools and do but i did camp america so i used that as my placement yeah. so i didn't wasn't getting it proper experience of of that so yeah i yeah i guess i probably could have known that sooner but like i don't regret it i don't regret no. it like it, it it paves its way into my business what i do right now anyway as long as you can take a positive from something there's no mm. point in really like regretting any aspects even if you deem it as a failure, you still learn something. Yeah, it, sure, you? for sure, for sure. So just moving back on to Talk 20s, obviously a business in the public eye on social media, um, you've got a, a big following on your personal account as well, mm. like similar to the, to the platform that you run. So how have you found that having, going from being a teacher where you can't really share stuff online to having a very like public business and a public sort of personal image? Obviously, like I'm on TikTok, and obviously all the students I used to teach are also on TikTok <laughs> as well. So I get a lot of comments like, "Are you Miss Mendes that used to teach French at this school?" <laughs> like all the time, and I, it makes me laugh like every mm. time because I'm like, they obviously like. I was actually a teacher for two years of my life. It feels like it was about a million years ago. Like I don't even really remember it that much, but to them it was probably like this is my teacher that's gone on to do this like who doesn't teach they they don't see you except from like in a classroom so to think that like a teacher has a life outside of that and doesn't even do that anymore and goes on it must be really it but must be like if what? a kid's at secondary yeah. school for five years and you were there for two you could have taught kids for like nearly half of their or if you no, i changed school changed so schools. yeah, yeah, yeah. But even a year yeah. at a school is still a long time yeah. for a kid yeah but also a lot of the kids that i taught because i taught when i was like 21 mm. A lot of the kids that I taught were like, you know, 15, 16, yeah. whatever. A lot of them are in their 20s now. <laughs> they actually are. They like, so it's yeah. like, yeah, I did teach you French, like, however many years ago. So, yeah, um, I, I guess I, I've never really been asked this question before. Um, but, yeah, I just, it, I, I don't think it's like, um, I don't think it's, 
I enjoy, I enjoy it because I think I'm I enjoy what I'm passionate about. So if you know if that means I get invited onto podcasts or you know um, to do interviews and and different things like that, I'm like it, it's because of what I'm building. It's not necessarily because of me. I don't think. But did we'll you see. always want to have a personal brand alongside Talk Twenties? Because some people will build a brand and then won't really want to show their face. I think doing what I do, you can't have to. Yeah. I think like it wouldn't be where it was if I hadn't. Just the simplest things, I had a TikTok go viral on my personal page um, a little while ago, and you could literally see how the stats change talk 20s. Okay. And it's like, when you see that, you're like, there's no argument for why I shouldn't. Like, because, you know, that's that's kind of definitely, you know, improving the growth. Because also people, people want to see the human side of the business that we're building. And so for me, like, I try and be as honest and as open as I can about the, the, the behind the scenes and things like that because people do find that side interesting so in a way yes but the thing is is that I don't want my, the whole of Talk 20's identity to be built around my personal brand because what other, some other people do is they put their personality into what they're building yeah. and I wanted that to be a separate thing so you can follow me as an individual and that's fine but like I'm not going to be the host of Talk 20's forever I'm not going to be you know I will always be the founder but I won't always be the front facing thing you know it'll be like blue peter presenters over time they'll change and evolve and who you'll see on the platform will be different so that doesn't really rely rely on me but my personal brand is a separate entity and that is separate but it feeds into that kind yeah. of machine if that makes sense so that you know it is still obviously a part of me but you don't look at talk 20s and just think that you know there is a whole team of us behind it working on okay. it have you ever seen the bad side of social media like hate or anything like that oh yeah yeah. yeah. <laughs> Can you remember the first bit of negative feedback you got to any content? I think it's whenever a post goes viral. Like, you'll just get some, like, the re- the post will probably go viral because people are uh, commenting, yeah. you know, silly things. Um, that's just part and the parcel of what you do. Like, it's really frustrating. We had a had an accountant on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. She's got a s- small, you know, grow, but growing following herself. And um, she did an amazing episode. It's one of my favorite episodes ever of how to go self-employed and run your own business from an accountancy point of view. Okay. And so we cut this episode into clips as we would for social media and stuff like that. And there's a part of the podcast where she talks about um, helping... Um, a content creator because she has quite a lot of influence and stuff like that on you know as clients helping an only fans content creator not helping them but them coming to her and saying um i want to get a boob job done as um part of you know and i can prove that my income will go up as a result of having this done can i expense it and she's like hell no definitely <laughs> no you can't do that but then she goes through the process. She was like, no, the content creator comes back and argues. I said, no, I, I think if I can prove this in X and Y, I can do this. And then she goes up, went to HMRC, and we managed to get advance approval that this would this would be okay and this would be allowed. So obviously she tells that story because it's super interesting. Like yeah. she was like, no, hell no, that's not going to be possible. And then she's like, oh, okay. Like, you know, and the world is changing. Like we are moving into different things. And I'm not saying everyone can claim a boob job on whatever kind of company you, it work, works. But the most annoying and frustrating thing is that clip has gone is you know it's been up for like 24 hours got over a hundred thousand views and then all the clips that are actually helpful information about <laughs> actually learning to be self-employed which are really great clips in themselves so educational you know on like a thousand yeah. and it's like oh like why is that the bit that goes viral and that's social media that's the frustrating side of things that's like you kind of yeah you just don't hate the player hate the game i think in that situation because it is it's annoying but that's what people ultimately interact with yeah and you're like oh like that's so annoying when you're trying to create something that's like an educational platform where people can learn it's like the clip about boob job that goes viral but it is what it is it, is, it makes me laugh when people like, just comment some angry stuff on yeah like we posted a we got a new podcast that's just launched and it's like uni confessions type stuff yeah um we posted a clip on tiktok and someone just commented god everyone can pick up a mic these days Ah, oh, did then, that hurt? Uh, a little bit at first, because that's like the first bit of like hate yeah. we've had, and I was like, "Ooh, God!" And then I, yeah. I just like commented back, "Thanks for the support." And then he put in capitals, "You are not interesting." I was mm. like, "Jeez, this bloke is." That's angry. TikTok for you. To be fair, I had a you know I had a post that went viral, and I, the one that I said helped you know us grow and talk twenties for sure, and um, it was about being in a nine year relationship at twenty seven. You know all the things that I'd learned. 
and um, loads of people commenting, like tagging their other halves because they've been in a relationship for that kind of amount of time. And, you know, like people commenting things, oh, this is so helpful and all this mm. kind of stuff. And then there's obviously like a few people like, don't push your experience on other people. And I'm like, okay, guys, just scroll past. You can just scroll past yeah. if you don't want to do that. And I wasn't pushing it on anyone. I was literally <laughs> just saying my own experiences. It's up to you if you want to listen. But then I think the one that made me laugh the most was quite simply, he's cheating on you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, He's that right now. I was literally looked over him on the sofa and I was thinking, that's absolutely hilarious. One, you are, it's just me in the video, so you have absolutely no idea who this person really is that I'm in the relationship with. So, cheers that you that you know that he's cheating on me because you so, somehow know who he is. And it literally just made me laugh because I was like, there's not that you know that would never happen in a million years. But and I know that, but I just think people are sad and they want, just want to. Yeah. But do you know what? Thank you because the way the algorithm works, if you comment. It boosts the posts. So yeah. cheers, cheers, I, babes. Like our Keep guy, <laughs> I, got, I was telling our guy at the studio about this person, like commenting on the video, and he was like, "Just keep replying." Yeah. Just reply to them because it'll boost up. And to be fair, I think like I'd posted it, and then like a couple hours later, look back, it was at maybe like two hundred views. Yeah. And then I had these comments to this guy, and then look back, it was at like six hundred. Yeah. So I was like, "Come on, mate, keep going." <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You just got to take the kind of pros of it, like because the bless her the accountant that came on the podcast she was like Gabby I've been so nervous she was like that one was going viral and all this <laughs> kind of stuff she's like I'm so nervous and I'm like you know you have to just take the benefits from it as much as you can there are always going to be people who you know who don't really know who you are and will try and tell you who you are yeah just don't listen I want to talk a little bit about pressure and obviously being a founder of any business there's pressure mm. um as you said before you're doing something that's not really been done before so there's an added level of pressure with that do you work better under pressure, do you think? I heard Stephen Bartlett say the other day that someone asked him, do you work well under pressure? And he said, I only work under pressure. I've become kind of numb to pressure. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think when you ask me that question, I'm just like, well, in what I'm doing, it's relentless. Like, it's getting up every single day, creating content, helping other young people, you know, replying to messages, you know, building something that has not been done before. So never not pressure there's never not pressure if that makes sense so it's just yeah. Con continuously so yeah i think he's probably right and in that you know i kind of i love it like mm -hmm. I, if, if i love what i do every single day but yeah constantly there is a you know a need to to continuously grow and we're setting high high targets for ourselves and you know and, and kind of continuously kind of you know pushing ourselves to do the best we can i never really sit around on my ass and do nothing what about risk a lot of risk yeah, how do you feel about risk? Quite good with risk. Yeah. Yeah, I've obviously had to do a lot of it in the past few years. Um, I'm a, I'm I'm good with risk, but I have to probably acknowledge that I am privileged in some kind of way. So I'm privileged in the fact that like I own my own home, like I have a mortgage and stuff like that. So you know, um, and I live with my fiance, who you know has been incredibly supportive of me launching this company and we kind of take it in turns to kind of pursue what it is that we want to do. And right now, like, well, for the past couple of years, it's been me and he's been like, you know, I'll hold down the fort. Like, obviously, like, I'm bringing him, like, money and things like that. But, like, it's much more that he's the consistent, continuous one because in business, you can never really know what you can pull out. Um, so, you know, he's been able to be there, but, like, he's just now taking a step back now that the business is in a good place for me. So now it's me that will be the continuous one because we can continue like that. Um, so I think for me, like no risk no reward so you have to kind of be able to do that but i can't not acknowledge that i've been able to take those risks because of circumstance does the risk so. get harder to make as the business gets bigger and there's more on the line uh it depends what the risk is um i'd probably say i am better at taking risks because every single time i have taken a risk it's ended up paying off so i'd say quitting teaching was a risk yeah. you know and then I got into the events industry and ended up building, you know, working on events that I was like, oh, I love these as, you know, as it was growing up, I've always imagined I could work at this venue. Then I quit my events job and now I'm building something that I really believe in. So I think actually it, you get a bit of like a, oh yeah, like I love it <laughs> sort of kind of feeling about, about risk. Um, but that being said, like I wouldn't, I think start off small and kind of grow into it. And there, there's taking a risk of being stupid mm. and then there's taking a, a risk that you kind of think 
it's not really a risk it's just like you know you're going to do it but you need to work really really hard in order for it to happen and then it will yeah. happen that, that's the kind of thing is that you have to kind of bet on yourself and I continuously bet on myself you mentioned like your your partner sort of holding down the fort while you were growing the business and now um now the business is doing well you're able to to sort of swap roles a little bit do you think you could have a successful relationship where both of you are founders of new businesses I talk about um, in relationships that one person always being the anchor. So that means one person that is going, okay, I'm a little bit more solid right now. Like I'm holding down the fort and the other person is able to do that. And I think you can, but like you need to be aware of who's the anchor at what point, because if you're both start like doing like startup things, I think that's when you can start to get super stressed because you're both like, ah, like what's going on. Yeah. And that really, really does require a team effort. Like you are, ultimately a team just as much you're a team with the business that you're growing I'm a team with him as well and so he can then we can then operate in in such a way that that really works so I think yes it's possible because ultimately he will definitely start his own businesses so like soon and what he's doing and stuff like that but I think it's about always knowing who is that anchor point and yeah. kind of going okay we got this and take and making sure that you take that in turns as well okay. what's one thing you wish if you go back to uni now, other than don't be a teacher, <laughs> what's one thing you wish you could know? Hold on for one more day. Like, that sounds ridiculous, but there's this song that's in the end of the Bridesmaids film. You know, if anyone's ever watched Bridesmaids, like that, the, the rom-com film, and it's like, um, I can't remember who it's by. Like, I'm going to have to probably ask, but yeah. Um, but it's like, hold on for one more day. And I used to <laughs> drive to school <laughs> where I was teaching, and I used to play that song like, it's like I know that there is pain, um, but hold on for one more day. Like oh, oh my god, it's like very. It's like it's quite an upbeat <laughs> song, but it's very emotional. And I used to drive to school, sobbing my eyes out, listening to "Hold On," and um, literally because I was that, that sad, like that yeah. sad about you know, is this adult life? I don't want to do this. Like it was so depressing, and um, just wasn't for me. I was. For, it is for some people. It just wasn't for me. Um, and I think if that song had maybe come in a little bit sooner, I might have maybe been able to just carry on a little bit more. But like once, yeah, it literally became ritual to be like, right, I'm driving to school now. I'll get all my tears out now. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and now when I hear that song, it kind of makes me feel really weird. Cause I'm like, I know that I've cried to the songs like so many times. And it was like my way of like releasing like my sadness. Mm. But now I listen to it and I'm like, oh, I'm so proud of how far I've come. That's great. So yeah, hold on for one more day. So if I could put someone in front of you now that, left uni a year ago and they're in a job that they absolutely hate what would you tell them listen to that song on repeat um <laughs> no i think i think it, it literally is that like um oh, there's a line in it that really that really like gets to me and i think it's like you've got no one to blame for your unhappiness you got yourself into your own mess that's right. the line in it <laughs> You better get this this up when when this podcast is edited. Be like, yeah, yeah. You then that's it, and you got yourself into your own mess. And I think because that 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 line in there, like this is so emotional. This this part of the podcast, but because that line is in there, I was like, I got myself into my own mess. I made the decision to do it. I can get myself out of it. And I think that's what anyone needs to kind of understand is that like, yeah, this might be your situation right now, but it's not going to be your situation forever. And you can. You, you, you've got no one else to blame for your unhappiness. You can get yourself out of your own mess. You can do it. You've got the power within you. Anyone can. So, yeah, that's probably what I'd say. No, that's amazing. That's, that's my last question. So thank you so much for, for coming on. I think for anybody, not even just in their 20s, anybody at mm -hmm. any stage of life that um, might be at a point of, you know, crossroads or, or just need a bit of extra advice, I think this conversation and your content is perfect mm. for them so uh, i appreciate it and thank you for coming on for a chat thank you